And we are back. Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show. I'm your host, Paul, aka the fly guy who's pretty armless outside of his bad puns. And this video, we're breaking down episode one of Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Taking place roughly six months after the events of Avengers Endgame, we follow Sam and Bucky as they adjust to their life after the blip. It's a better pilot than the dude hijacking the plane, and it makes for an awesome opening that's gonna have myself and every other Marvel maniac grip for the next six weeks. Throughout this video, we're gonna be breaking down the story, easter eggs, things you missed, and how the characters compare to the comics to give our fan theories on why everyone is Mephisto. Now we start off with Sam ironing his shirt, but what we discover is an event at the Smithsonian which involves him handing his shield over to the Captain America exhibit. You may remember that this first appeared in Captain America The Winter Soldier, and both Steve and Bucky ventured out to it during the film. Sam places the shield back into the brown bag that Steve gave him, metaphorically symbolising how he has returned it to the place that it came from. Over the top of the scene, we hear the dialogue from Endgame in which Steve asked Sam how it felt with the shield. He replied with like it's someone else's, and this line is clearly a driving force for the character's actions, as he very much feels like he can't live up to the mantle. Now though we only get brief glimpses of his room, this does help to paint out his mind state. Often in TV shows and films, the way people's houses are kept can signal what's going on with them mentally. Sam's room is a bit messy, which completely juxtaposes the appearance that he's trying to give off with the suit. This could showcase that he's trying to present to the world that everything's a-okay, when, as we learn throughout the episode, he's struggling with a lot of issues. Bit of a reach here, however, we can compare this room to what the Avengers lived in at the HQ, and this feels a lot more like Sam is on tough times, which is confirmed later on with the banker. And he's a right bloody banker. Now, the Avengers, including Sam, were instrumental in saving the universe, and though the thank yous that they receive are great, it's clear that the character isn't being showered with riches, so he still struggles with keeping a roof over his head. Now, this is likely why he had to re enlist in the Air Force, and in The Winter Soldier, we learn that he was part of a pararescue unit. However, after his wingman, pun intended, died, he turned to helping veterans with PTSD. Sam has returned to active duty and we watch as he tackles a group known as the LAF who have hijacked a plane. They are led by Batroc the Leaper, who you will probably remember from the Winter Soldier. He's gone from hijacking boats to hijacking planes and it's an awesome action scene to kickstart the series with. The character appears in purple and yellow, similar to how he did in the Winter Soldier, and these are the colours that he typically tends to don. Now Batroc is a French native who joined the Foreign Legion where he was trained in combat before he became an intelligence officer in the French Secret Service. Credited with 36 kill missions, he was an amazing asset to the French government, but when he realised his skills could be used for profit, the character became a mercenary. Wanted by the FBI, SAS and Interpol, he gained a big reputation, which is when he caught the eyes of Nick Fury. Or rather, just the eye. Now, Fury paid the character to hijack a vessel at the start of the Winter Soldier, and using this as cover, Natasha was able to sneak in and carry out a classified mission to uncover secrets about Project Insight. He's an expert in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and though he's had his butt handed to him by both Cap and his sidekick, I definitely think that he will be back in the series. Now another reach here, but the officer tells Sam that the op has to be subtle, and Sam then falls backwards out the plane in a Christ-like pose. This kind of imagery is present in a lot of superhero films, and we're at a point now where even Zack Snyder is memeing on himself for all his callbacks to Christ. I don't know if they're making fun of this motif here, but it is quite strange how they have this play out immediately after saying how things should be kept subtle. Now it's during this scene that we're introduced to First Lieutenant Taurus, who you may recognise as a big player in the graphic novel run Sam Wilson Captain America. In the work, Taurus was captured by a group known as the Serpent Society and he was experimented on. Made into a half-man, half-falcon hybrid, the character ended up becoming somewhat of a sidekick to Sam throughout most of the run. The book was kick-started with an elderly Captain America giving the shield to Sam and he had to deal with how unpopular this was whilst also making his own way. During it he fought US Agent, the Flag Smasher and teamed up with Bucky so it does seem to be a basis for this adaptation. 
I think they will probably take some elements of that and ground it a lot more with characters like Torres potentially becoming the new Falcon when Sam eventually becomes Captain America, which yeah, probably gonna be how the show ends. We see this grounded aesthetic apply to a lot of aspects in the MCU, such as Sam and the bird Red Wing, whom can telepathically communicate with one another in the source material. As always, in this continuity, Sam controls the machine through an ear link up, but it is important to see how these things are set up in the comics and how they are carried across. Now, Red Wing is also important because you know who else has a Red Wing? Mephisto. I'm telling, I'm, tell, I'm telling you, gonna do one of those a video, right? So keep an eye out for them. Now, we do learn that Red Wing has been outfitted with the latest Stark technology and actually see some of Iron Man's weapons being used on the bird, including a laser which can cut through the doors on the plane. This laser also appeared in Infinity War as a way for Stark to cut a hole in Ebony Moore's ship. It's an incredible action scene in which we see Sam using the wings like a shield, and this is a very important characteristic for Captain America to have. In the book that the series is based on, they even have a whole bit about how Cap chose his symbol to be a shield rather than a gun, as he wanted to be seen as a defender instead of a conqueror. Though subtle, it does show that Sam has what it takes to be Cap, even though he may not believe it himself. After taking to the skies, we watch as Sam has an aerial dogfight with some helicopters as he tries to retrieve the contact from Batroc's men. In our trailer breakdown for the show, we did say that these jumpsuits looked very similar to ones used by Hydra, but after watching the episode, I'm not sure whether they're involved or not. Yep, WandaVision has officially killed my need to do fan theories. They are still out there as we last saw them taking Cross's pin particles in Ant-Man, but it's likely that the imagery just looks similar rather than them being linked to the events. Sam saves the contact before they hit the Libyan border and we join him and Torres in Tunisia where the pair discuss the villains of the piece. That is the Flag Smashers. These guys are sort of a flash mob that, similar to the LAF, are taking advantage of all the chaos caused by the blip. Now in the comics, this wasn't a group and instead it was a single man who went under the moniker. Flag Smasher believed that nationalism was a real problem in the world and thus he had a vendetta against Captain America, who was of course the symbol of an entire country. In Sam Wilson, Captain America, we actually come across an LMD version of the character at one point and he goes off on a monologue about how all the borders should be open across the world as this will truly provide people with freedom instead of making them have to bend to the will of the government. As mentioned, he was adverse to nationalism because he believed that it always led to fascism and fascism always led to war. Thus, in his mind by stopping humanity from going down this path, he was saving several lives. They sort of pay lip service to the bit about borders with Torres explaining the motives of the group, but one of the major things that isn't in the comics that he brings up is that they think life was better in the blip. As Sam states, if something gets good for one group, it usually gets worse for another, and it sort of got me thinking about the economy in the blip itself. Say you were a factory worker at Amazon, if the board members in middle management all got dusted, then chances are you'd get promoted to something quite high up. You'd get more money and could have a better standard of living, which could be the sort of thing that Torres is referring to. Now because the snap was also just 50% of the planet and not 50% of certain areas, there may have been some countries that lost a lot of their population, whereas others didn't, and the talk of borders could have meant that they opened up a lot more so people had free travel. We've never really seen the inner workings of what happened during the blip, but something that's interesting with the Flag Smashers that we see is that they have superhuman abilities. This could either be because they're, they're super soldiers themselves, mutants, or even scrolls. Yeah, we're, we're, we're back on the fan theory train now. Now, personally, I, I'm leaning more in with the first theory, as that's obviously tied to Captain America, but let me know below exactly what you think. Now, in One Division, we watched as Haywood try to resurrect the Vision in order to provide the planet with a defense system, and it is possible that the Flag Smashers were experimented on for this very reason. Flag Smasher in the comics, on the whole, just tended to be a normal guy with a skill set better than Liam Neeson's, but it looks like they've changed a lot of stuff here. Now, an interesting aspect is that Captain America has disappeared. A lot of people, myself included, believe that the show would start with Sam and Bucky faking his death so that he could lie in peace, but it is known that the character is alive and well. One of the fan theories is that he's hidden away on the moon, but as we all know, he's actually the President of the United States. 
Now moon bases have appeared in the comics and there's even one that the Watchers used to spy on Earth from. It's also tied in heavily with the Inhumans but whether they appear or not we're just going to have to see. However, the idea of him being hidden away in space could be a nod to the Avengers game in which he was placed on an orbiting satellite around the planet. What I think happened though ties back to the way that the Russo brothers described the ending of Endgame and though this contradicts what the writers have put out, the Russos said that when Cap went back in time to have a life with Peggy, he actually created a branch timeline where the pair lived together. At the end of the movie, he then journeyed back to the main one and handed Sam the shield. If that's the case, then the guy probably just jumped back to his one and that's why there's no trace of him in this show. Now Sam returns the shield to the Smithsonian, which the government thank him for and we also get Rhodey stopping by too. I know the phrase Luke Skywalker level cameo has been banded about a lot recently but yeah, even though it wasn't that level, it was nice to see him pop up here as he's one of my favourite characters in the MCU. Now there is an ulterior motive going on here and we learn at the end of the episode that the government wanted the shield so that they could appoint their own Captain America, namely John Walker, played by Wyatt Russell. This cosplay cap in the comics is a character known as US Agent who from time to time has walked the line between being a hero and villain. I'll talk about this more later on but because of the way that the government official says to Sam it was the right thing to do, I kind of feel like they might have put pressure on him to hand over the shield. You don't just make a Captain America overnight and he was likely put through testing phases with the other applicants so I feel like this has been in the making for a long time. Sam clearly regrets his decision realising he gave up the mantle and we also get a great scene in the Smithsonian where he and Rhodey discuss the shield and what it means. There's a great bit of symbolism here where we see a poster of Steve with I want you written on the top of it and Sam stands directly in front of it. Because of the way that it's lined up, Steve is pointing to Sam saying he wants him to become Captain America but Sam just doesn't feel like he's a worthy replacement. There is further symbolism when Sam stands in front of the shield but he's slightly off centre showing that he doesn't quite align with it yet. This iconography was too used in Into the Spider-Verse with Miles not having his face line up with the mask before it did when he was ready. Cut to one of the Winter Soldier's missions years ago and we see as he takes out a VIP and all of his security team. Though this is a flashback, it does feel like a nod to the comic book run as in that the first time that we see Bucky, he's doing something similar. Like that moment in the book, we don't quite know the time period that this scene takes place in and it feels like it's put there to make us think that Bucky might have turned to the dark side. Hail Snydra. However, whereas in that it was shown to just be, be totally innocent, he was just doing a mission, here it's a flashback. Because the Winter Soldier needed to remain a myth, he also made us someone who's a witness to the mission and we later learn that this is the son of a man that Bucky has been trying to make amends with. In fact, the entire arc he goes on in this episode seems to be him trying to right the wrongs of the past. We also join him in therapy with a character that we know from the trailers will be returning. Bucky has trouble adjusting because of his life as the Winter Soldier and in real world terms this phrase actually means someone who just goes from war to war which, because of his hibernation, he ended up doing. Bucky journeyed to a senator that was a Hydra pawn and someone that continued to abuse her power even after they fell. Bucky beat up one of her hired assassins and then stated that he'd changed before handing over info to the authorities so that they could arrest her. Now this scene in the way that we see a man and woman in a car felt very similar in setup in the way that it was shot to the murder of the Starks. Whereas in that he killed Howard before moving on to Maria, here he just hits the guy in the face and leans in the window to tell the senator that he's changed. Another interesting aspect that we learn in this scene is that Bucky is truly alone. He hasn't texted anyone, has the social life of a YouTuber and I think this series will set him up with a relationship and that he will actually start dating people. We then jump to his home in Brooklyn which of course he and Steve lived in as kids. He breaks up another fight involving a trash can in an alley and also says that he hasn't danced since 1943 which of course is something that was mirrored in Steve. Now the father's story about his son is heartbreaking because he says he will never know what happened to his son. Bucky doesn't tell him in this episode but I think a big moment will come in the season when he finally does. Jump to Louisiana to see Sam going home. Anthony Mackie is actually from here so this is also a cool little tie to him. We learn that his parents are called Paul which is a great name and Darlene and also meet his sister and his nephews. 
His nephews were teased in a recent Xbox ad, I, I think, I don't know, I never have time to play games anymore, and we learn that their parents' shrimping business is hanging on by a thread that's only being kept afloat by his sister Sarah. Bucky chats up a, a lovely lady, and she says that he sounds like her dad, probably because the lad is 106 love. He also says he wears a glove because of poor circulation, but it's more like no circulation. Hey, having that... Great joke. Now, the pair play battleships and a drinking game which involves telling the truth. Bucky pretty much paints out that he has no family, and we see the guilt get far too much for him, which makes him almost confess the murder. However, he doesn't, and he just pays for the lunch, but we see that Nakajima is number one on the list, showing how highly he views writing this wrong. In Switzerland, we see the attack by the Flag Smashers, in which they steal some unknown objects. At the location, people are handed out masks and then told to run, which is run in Swiss. See, whilst new rock stars, yeah, they're translating Latin, we're over here translating Ren to run. Now, all the people running about and causing chaos, that allows Flag Smasher to escape, and the so-called leader of them easily beats up Torres before making off into the night. At the bank, though Falcon is seen as a hero, it doesn't mean much when it comes to money and his loan request is rejected because he has no credit history due to the snap. You'd think the bank would take that into account, but the character leaves without getting anything other than a selfie. Also, the license plates as usual could have significance to them. The one we see in this scene says 184, which is an issue of Captain America and the Falcon, in which the Red Skull returns and holds America hostage. There's also a bit where the names of the producers appear on screen for the names of the vanished, and this includes Victoria Alonso, who's headed up many Marvel projects. Sam refusing to sell their parents' legacy returns to the boat to try and start it, but it doesn't work. Also, we see a little bird and a globe on the dash, and a bird easter egg, yeah, because he's called Falcon. Best easter eggs on the net, folks. Torres then sends him a video message of the Flag Smashers, and we get the crushing news announcement that there's a new Captain America, which ends the episode. Now, who exactly is this? Well, as mentioned earlier, this is John Walker, the new Captain America. We're going to be breaking him down in just a bit, but if you're enjoying the video so far, then I'd massively appreciate the thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe and click the bell to never miss one of our weekly breakdowns on the show. I also want to thank all of you for your support on WandaVision, as it helped me to get early access to this episode, and it's meant I can take more time, so I appreciate each and every one of you. Now, US Agent was first introduced in the comics as the supervillain Super Patriot. Walker was a counter to Captain America, and he was set up as a way to embody the patriotism in opposite to the hero. Whereas Cap showed off the good aspects of American patriotism, Walker showed off the bad bits, and this put the pair at odds with one another. He did kind of go back and forth as a hero and villain over the years, and currently he stands as someone who's mainly a good guy. Now at one point, when Steve quit his Cap, he stepped into his shoes, but wasn't really that well received. Sort of, if you want a good analogy, then think of Asriel in Batman Nightfall, and you sort of get the idea. In having him take over the role, it helped to better define what Captain America truly meant by showing what it shouldn't mean, and this will likely be carried across to the series. I feel like Walker will initially appear in a positive light and end up attending parades and so on, but he will have a lot more of a sinister side to him and will eventually go toe to toe with Sam. In the comics, namely Sam Wilson, Captain America, he's actually hired by Captain America to fight Sam, and the pair face off against one another in a big action scene. Now Cap did this because, look, it was a weird time when, when him saying things like, Hail Hydra, that, that was all about, you know this stuff. And yeah, it, it was a weird one. Point is though, that this was sanctioned by a government figurehead, and Agent actually refused to fight Sam until Cap stepped in and told him what to do. I think at some point Walker might be reluctant to take on Sam, but that the government may push him into doing it because he makes them look bad. Either way though, I'm very excited for the future, and on the whole, I absolutely love the first episode. Having the Snyder Cut and this release back to back has made this for an amazing week, and both are great comic book entries that you definitely should check out. Now, whereas I was a bit unsure on One Division in the first two episodes, here I'm completely on board. The acting is superb, the production quality is amazing, and this really feels like a film that not only has amazing moments of action, but also necessary human drama that you should be getting from these conflicted characters. 
I really didn't think there would be many fan theories that we could make with this show, but my mind's already racing over what could happen next, where Steve is, and what's going on with the Flag Smashers. Though Zemo is absent for now, going forward he will obviously be a big player, as will Sharon Carter. I think it's also a testament to how good this episode is that Sam and Bucky never actually meet and we're still just as hyped to see them on screen. I think the latter will probably go to the former asking for help which will also be a great moment and this will sort of set up the Flag Smasher showdown as well as the Zemo arc. Overall this is a brilliant first entry and we now know from the director that the series will be setting up three more MCU stories. I'm guessing that they're Armor Wars, Secret Invasion and potentially Ms. Marvel but we will of course have to see. A big plotline involving a virus was apparently reworked in the wake of the pandemic so who knows that may even be Terrigen Mist and we could be getting the Inhumans at some point. I don't know yeah I'm gonna stop with these fan theories but what an absolutely incredible way to bring us back to the MCU with a bang. Even though it's just been one empty week uh, since WandaVision, the, the wait yeah it felt so long and I'm glad that we have some more amazing content like this to tie us over until May which hopefully is when Black Widow releases. Fingers crossed yeah. Now obviously I'd love to hear your thoughts on the episode so make sure you comment below and let me know. As a thank you for interacting with the video, you'll be entered into a prize drawn the 31st of March in which we're giving away 3 copies of a Marvel 4K box set of your choice. All you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the episode. The winners of last month's competition are on screen right now so if that's you then message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch then make sure you check out our ending explained breakdown of the Snyder Cut in which we talk about not only what those final scenes mean but also what's meant to be happening in Justice League 2 and 3 if they ever get made. Thank you for sitting through the video, I've been Paul, I hope you have a great weekend and I'll see you next Friday. Take care, peace.